Everybody's got a story. You just have to listen. Hola, I'm Joe Partavilla, and this is Good Listen. And today, James III tells his story. You know, there's nothing like making somebody laugh. And there's probably nothing better than getting paid to make somebody laugh. James is a super talented actor, writer, and producer known for his work with the legendary sketch comedy group, The Astronomy Club. We're gonna talk about his love of comedy, how he made the jump from Akron to New York City, and perform at the legendary Upright Citizens Brigade Theater, and what it's like to make a career in comedy. James, how are you? I am well, how are you? It's good to see you. Good to see you, James. And I kinda wanna start by talking about the first comedic memory you have. And wow. I'm gonna take you back to mine. So mine was, and I was just thinking about this before we started, was who shot Buckwheat on Saturday Night Live when the <laughs> SNL had this running gag for weeks. And I think I looked it up, it's like, it was 40 years ago. It was that's how long, so I'm showing my age wow. here. But um, it was this running gag where obviously people know Eddie Murphy played Buckwheat famously, but they wanted yeah. to kill the character. And this was post like who shot JR. They did this running bit and SNL never does this. They still don't do it. Whereas a running bit that ran like for multiple weeks on the show with yeah. like uh, short films, they're, they find out who the sh killer was and they talk about the killer. And to me, that is like the first time I, as a child, was like, this is so effing funny. Like this, like yeah. I still remember to this day, like watching it play out because it was like, unlike, I was like, unlike, unlike anything we've ever seen before. Cause I watched SNL yeah. and then all of a sudden, wait, there's a narrative? I guess as a kid, I don't think this, but wait, there's a narrative running from week to week? This is so weird. What are you doing here? Uh, so do you have a memory like that that sticks out from your early childhood? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if this is the first memory, but a, a, a pretty early one is there's this episode of the Dick Van Dyke Show. I used to, I used to love watching uh, Nick at Night. And there's this episode of the Dick Van Dyke Show called The Return of Happy Spangler. And essentially what happens in it is... A, a guy who's from, it's not necessarily vaudeville, but he's he's not used to, he doesn't do radio and he doesn't do uh, their live show, or maybe he does radio. He's like used to radio or used to vaudeville or something. And he and he comes on and guest writes for the Alan Brady show with with Dick Van Dyke and everybody. And he doesn't write a single thing for, for uh, the whole week. And like, and Dick's like, what, I, I thought you were Rob. He's like, why, I thought you were... You know, I, I, you're you're the you're the greatest. Like, why aren't you why aren't you writing anything down? And he's like, because you can't you can't uh, fall down anymore. You can't. You know, people don't. It's it's not PC. It's, it's literally like it's not PC to pr have a prat fall and like hurt yourself anymore. And so then, so then, uh, Dick like writes a, a whole monologue where he does a lecture on comedy, and he's like, today's comedy doesn't you know you can't fall down or hurt your foot and while he's talking about this he's doing all of the things that you can't do like he's you know he's he gets his tie stuck in the in the uh he gets his tie stuck in the desk and he like bangs his head on the desk and he's like oh <laughs> you know and he like gets up to leave and he gets stuck in the garbage can and like trips over the and it's just like this hilarious thing talking about the state of comedy while while he's also being like a hilarious slapstick buffoon and oh. it's I, I have always wanted, I aspire to that. I still, to this day, aspire to something as funny as as that bit. At the end, it's at the end of that episode. The episode ends with with this hilarious bit. Oh, that's so great. That's awesome. I'm, 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 you know, I never got a Dick Van Dyke as a kid. I was always like, a, in, the, in the 80s, for, for whatever reason, it didn't run that much. So I remember I yeah. was just like a Brady Bunch and Gilligan's Island kid. But it's so funny you talk about the future, the current state of comedy, because one of my pet peeves nowadays is you can't do that anymore. Oh, you can't do <laughs> yeah. that movie anymore. Like it drives me crazy. And, and because it's like, yeah, there's a lot of things that change that you don't do anymore. The movies <laughs> exactly. from the seventies were way different from the movies in the forties. <laughs> so you can, you could have said, boy, you can't do the Godfather in 1940. Yeah, no shit. Because they, they right. didn't have that perspective. <laughs> So what is your take on that? Because I know a lot of it, especially in comedy, this comes up. Um, I'm a huge Mel Brooks guy. And yeah. uh, and a lot of his comedies come up in this conversation. Can't do Blazing Saddles anymore. What, right. What's your take on that thought process? 
Yeah, I mean, it's. Yeah, I think it's, what you said is absolutely right. Like, comedy evolves, and there are just certain things that, you know, it, 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 and, and evolves with the times, right? You know, there are certain things that just aren't funny, you know, anymore. They literally, literally don't make someone laugh anymore. You know, it starts to make people, you know, the, the mass consciousness feel differently than the mass consciousness felt at the time, you right. know, when, when these things were, were funny, you know, obviously there were people at those times that also found them offensive then, you know, like, right. And, but it's, but it's, it's when the, it's when we all catch up to that, you know, is, is when, you know, comedy starts to evolve. And I think, you know, I, I, I think that it is like, you know, it, it's, it's what I love about that bit that I just, that I just mentioned is that, is that that bit turned what that comedian who thought this was passe and you couldn't do anymore on its head, turned it on its head, you know? And so there are, you know, there are ways to be smart about comedy instead of like just, you know, punching down or just doing what, you know, like, like you can, if, are, if you are funny and if you, um, you know, know what you are trying to say, and trying to reach people, I think that you can do that, you know? Um, uh, and if, and if you only rely on like, I just want to be able to call people X, Y, and Z, it's like, well, <laughs> maybe you're not, <laughs> maybe you're not cut for this, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. It's so funny. So you and I ran in similar circles at UCB in, in New York city. You were obviously way better than I was more successful. Yeah. I mean, I took the classes <laughs> around on like the weeknight shows and stuff like that. But I want to talk about your love of sketch comedy because that's basically your bag, your your specialty, uh, so to speak. And I was curious because you're from Ohio originally, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. how? Tell me about your upbringing in terms of like falling in love with sketch comedy. So for me, I mentioned at the top, SNL was like my interest to sketch comedy. You know, I went to yeah. used to be for improv. I realized. I suck at improv because I'm way too in my head. I'm thinking about funny things to say. I can do it, but loved actually executing sketch comedy, working yeah. in collaboration with people. How did you fall in love with sketch? Yeah, I um, in in Ohio uh, and in my and in Akron, that's where I'm from. Uh, there were um, a couple performing arts schools, so I was in a performing arts middle school, and then also went to a performing arts um, high school. And I mean, and maybe even a little bit before that, I was like always like doing voices and and things, um, you know, and try and and you know trying to do like impressions of cartoon characters. But I think specifically sketch comedy um, became a thing for me in in middle school. I did um, a Commedia dell'arte. We had a Commedia dell'arte troupe, and we and so that that basically what we did was we did like a series of like structured impro improvisations that we would then write down and then, and then, and then perform those, you know? And so like, that was kind of the early s sketch that I got to do. I remember watching, this is not sketch, but I remember watching a lot of like, um, whose line is it anyway, as like sort of being the early, um, uh, like group comedy influences. And then like, I mean, Mad T I loved Mad TV. I didn't watch SNL as much. I loved Mad TV. And then, and all that on, on Nickelodeon was, a, was big for me. Like, like I, I watched every, I still have, uh, uh, VHS recordings of <laughs> like, of like all of those episodes. And so, um, and like, in the fact that it was kids doing it too. Um, so those were like my big, like early, uh, sketch influences. Awesome. And so let's talk about the jump from going from Akron to New York. And if you go and walk, well, I guess UCB is not the same as it used to be, but at, at when I was was at, when I was hanging around U, UCB, they had an office with with like with with rehearsal spaces. It was yeah. it was like amazing. It was like a kid in a candy store. Um, but one thing that was pretty common in those days was they all looked like me. There was all just <laughs> sure. a bunch of white dudes, white girls, Absolutely. <laughs> and then all of a sudden. Here comes this goddamn astronomy club. <laughs> Wait a minute. Man, they not a bunch of white guys and white girls. Black people in the... <laughs> I didn't What's know there could be black people doing improv and sketch comedy. <laughs> <laughs> so I was curious, and you know, this is one of these things where I, one of the reasons I love doing podcasts is because having conversations like this may be awkward in, in real life. But like, can you tell me like what you were thinking and 
how you were able to break through it being so different from everybody else. Because one of yeah. the things I remember Anthony Tamanek, as you probably know, was one of my first teachers of improv. And he always talked about how, how UCB and, and in these improv schools was like Scientology. It was, yeah. it was like, yeah, absolutely. you know, you, you paid money to be part of the gang. And then the more money you paid, you rose the ranks. And again, when you, when to be part of this is you have to have money. You have to be yeah. coming from an affluent society. Oh, you know, it's all this shit that happens uh, in, in society these days. But then, you know, how do we get diversity of thought when it's right. everyone looking the same? So if you don't mind going back and telling me about, you know, you walking through those doors for the first time, you know, maybe yeah. how, you know, how the group formed. Can you take me back to those days? Yeah, well, well, just going off of that 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 anecdote from Antamonic is is that. I, I always say Ant Tamanic. A Tamanic yeah. is <laughs> It's a weird spelling. No one no one can ever spell. I don't think he knows but how I, to spell his name. Yeah. Uh is is that I was fortunate enough to to uh get the diversity scholarship for my first like couple classes. So like I I because I do not come from money and had four dollars to my name at the time of of taking <laughs> um classes. Um and um and so, and so, where sort of where astronomy club came from is like you know was that idea? I I I had auditioned for I got through all my all my core uh, curriculum and I was able to audition for uh, Harold and I did not get on, and I do not think I didn't get on because of of race. That was not how I how I was l looking at it. However, I I went to Lloyd Night that first Lloyd Night. And the teams came out and I was in the and it may, had, may have had something to do with the lighting. Like I was in the back of the house and just just I saw a bunch of shiny white people walk out on stage. Like literally the thought was, look at the look at the gleaming white. People. You know, the, it was the lights and stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and I and I was just like, um, and, and at the time you could audition as a as a team. You could you could you could come together as a team. And, audition. and so it was just like, OK, my plan is to audition with a bunch of of black people. Um, and, uh, and so I had that idea and, uh, you know, reached out to a bunch of people. I was also already playing on a team called Nobody's Token, which a handful of members from Astronomy Club were also in, you know, and I re I reached out to a bunch of people and, uh, and the, the, we had a couple practices and then the, the team, the, the eight of us, um, uh, you know, started to gel and and meet regularly before uh before auditioning the next year you know and i think we i think we had like maybe four three or four months of of like regularly practicing together um before uh doing our 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 set i still remember moments from our from our audition uh set it was a lot of fun <laughs> um and and we were fortunate enough to 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 be put on as a as, as a house team we were i think we performed on Lloyd night for just a year. And then we had, and in that time we started doing sketch and did a, we had a, like a black history month show that was an hour. And then we, we cut that down to a half hour and that ran as, uh, as a spank. That is what they call the, 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 uh, running shows. shows that they have there. And, yeah. um, and, and we had that spank for about a, about a year and change. We took it to LA, you know, did it in LA for uh, a couple nights. And it was like, it was really great. And from, from there, you know, we started getting, we were sketch comics to watch um, and got to do a sketch series from Comedy Central at, at Comedy Central. After that, um, the, the tape from the Comedy Central show, like was essentially like a, a pilot, you know, that we were able to then, uh, shop around when we were when we were trying to get our uh, Netflix series made, and so that's the I, that's you know tr a truncated <laughs> yeah. version of everything. But that Ten was years. the that was the journey, right? <laughs> that was the journey. And uh, when you were going through this, I mean, one of one of the things like your timing was spectacular because your show on Comedy Central and then you went to Netflix was you were right smack dab in the middle of the streaming wars, where all of yeah. a sudden all these companies were like. Holy shit! We need content. Comedy's cheap. It's not that expensive. We we hire some guys, and and you got on Netflix. What was it like doing a show where you guys essentially you you had total control? It wasn't like yeah. you were doing a show, a network show, where you had executives standing outside. Hey, what are they doing there? Was it? Oh, that's funny. Like you were given total control. 
to do this. Yeah. And for artists, that's that's crap. Like, you know, Mark yes. Scorsese's yeah. going off on that right now with Apple. Like he's Apple's writing him these stupid two hundred million dollar checks for movies that like a yeah. small amount of people are gonna watch. And they're and he's like, Cool. I don't care if no one's gonna watch this, but Apple's giving me two hundred million dollars to do a historical film about, you know, it's fucking crazy. the first <laughs> FBI murder case. But as a as a comic, this is just gold, right? What was that yeah. like? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess the first thing I'll say is like is I don't know if have if eight people could ever have total control <laughs> you know like there was True. so you know um uh we were we had to we certainly had to filter a few things uh uh through through the you know the, the higher ups and 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 whatnot but but to your point you know really sort of being they did let us run kind of run with it you know and it was it was great it was really awesome it was a really great experience um for all of us to sort of get together be able to i mean i think we wrote something like uh, we wrote like a hundred and change, one hundred and fifty sketches. You know, like that might I might be. I'm not sure if I'm over shooting it at one fifty or if like that's the exact number. But it's we we crossed a hundred for wow. for sure. And um, and like and we you know we had to narrow that down to thirty. And it, and uh, but it was like it was really great to kind of figure out like, you know, what are our voices together in this way? Because you know we had written. You know, we had our ske a couple sketch shows that we had done, but like, it wasn't like this. You know, it wasn't like you know, it wasn't like trying to figure out six episodes of of a series. And so it was just, it was it. There was so much more ground to cover, and like, and getting able to s sort of oversee. You know, we each got to oversee our individual sketches that we wrote, and so being able to you know have some have input in what costume design was and have input in like in the casting of the whenever we needed to go outside of the group and 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 all of that was just really it was truly like it was a magical experience at the time you know um uh and i like, can't even and, imagine yeah. what that must have been like just to have like a budget because i remember you know i was in a yeah. sketch group for three years and literally the budget was like what we could afford like what kind yeah, of costumes yeah. we get from Amazon and then return them <laughs> because you don't want to, yeah. you don't want to, you, you want to be stuck with a costume. That must've been like a kid in the candy store type stuff. And I'll, I'll even say that I, it was really remarkable. I had a, there were a couple sketches that I got to be a part of. And I'm sure other members of astronomy club had this experience too, but there are a couple of sketches that I got to be a part of that. I, you know, one of my, one of my, sketches that I did was uh, Cat Williams teaching Shakespeare to to a bunch of kids and like I had that was like my oldest character like I had been doing that since like maybe my second or third year of doing comedy at UCB wow. and so it was like oh I've been I've been sitting with this for so long and now like there's a classroom full of of students and I'm I'm like decked out like Cat Williams and I think it was uh uh, Friday after next, it was like that outfit that he that he wow. wore, and it was like to see that fully realized in that way. And then I had the same experience on the Comedy Central show, and I'm sure we all felt this way because we were all all in this sketch. Um, but where we the George Washington Carver sketch that we used to just do, we were wearing all black because that was our costume for the mm -hmm. the the stage show. Yeah, and we would just sit in chairs. You know, we would just sit in chairs wearing all black to see it. In a in a room that looked like it was straight out of, you know, the early or late eighteen hundreds, <laughs> yeah. America. You know, it was like, what are we? This is crazy. Does, we're all in these costumes. You know, you have a perm hair. Do it was like this is crazy to see, <laughs> to see it. That's, you know, fully realized in that way. That's so cool. And you know, we, you kind of yada yada the length of time you've been together with the astronomy club. But you know, oh, I mentioned yeah. it was ten years. Yeah, I mean, ten years you guys have worked together. Tell me about oh, the longevity of the group yeah. because in creative co collaborations, that's really, really hard. I mean, like I said, my group was three years, and I thought that was like a miracle that we lasted three years. But mm -hmm. tell me about working with people who obviously have different th opinions on what's funny. I mean, you guys have a current, you guys have a, like a common sense of what works together, but you guys have all yeah. different opinions. Tell me about the longevity and how that played out. I think I think we had been together at the time of the show. I think we had been together six, seven years by the time at the time of the show, and I'll say and I'll, and that's the I think that's the height of the most work we've done together. You know, we still every now and again we'll we'll hop on a show um, now, but at that time, um, 
you know, it's hard. It is hard, you know, to your point, eight different voices. We had some great, you know, it's it's great when certain people are able to kind of step up and, and be and be leaders, We you know, and just to shout them out uh, real quick. Uh, Jonathan Braylock, Jarrah Milligan, Keisha Zoller. Jonathan and 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 Keisha were head writers for the the the, the sketch show that we did, um, and um, and uh, and one of the seasons of the I'm not sure if it was both seasons of the the Comedy Central show or if it was the second season. We call them seasons. Each sketch was an episode, and there was two seasons of the of the show. Six six sketches ultimately. Um, and you know, and and Jira's a uh, big producer-minded uh, uh, a person, and, and just was uh, always kind of spearheading emails and and like con- and connecting us with people, and 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 you know, and so it was really great. And 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 once we got the show, uh, we were all sort of figuring out how we can, because no no one had, we all had equal kind of you know. Uh, we were all co EPs and writers and, and create, you know, and so we all sort of figured out how we can how we can step up in these different different ways for that show. But I definitely think that like that that during uh, during our our run, you know, it was really great to have like voices like that that were sort of able to help <laughs> kind of streamline, you know, uh, uh, and that we can kind of lean on in the in that way. Um, and then also like, you know, when we're improvising, you know, the various coaches that came in and, and, oh, and I got to shout out, uh, Carl Foreman, who was our director on the, the sketch show that we did at UCB, you know, w- voices like that coming in and, and, and then, and then now that I, since I'm shouting out names, Dan, pa- Dan Powell, uh, at Irony Point operated as a, I, I don't think in actual title, uh, he- head writer of the show, but he pr- produced the show and was in the, and was in the room and was kind of the. You know, he was that he had the the seat at the table, <laughs> the the head seat at the table that we got that kind of helped to filter voices as well. And so, you know, um, um, yeah, I mean, I I I figuring out the balance of the team was was tough at first, you know, and like and 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 um, and and really, I think it's a testament to like, you know, every everybody's hard work and dedication to each other, but then you know, particularly those those voices that were able to like really step up and and lead. No, that's cool. Was there any a, a point where there was, and I'm sure there was like moments of a fracture or something, but like, oh sure, how, how did you get through the, the like the the pain points? Like, was there one person who stepped in and be like, well, let's let's cool it off, let's go, because. We've all been there, whether you're doing comedy or you're working in an office that, you know, you people working so closely together, you're going to get on each other's nerves. It's almost like yeah. being in a, in a relationship in a, in with, a, with a spouse uh, where you ca- like little things will set you off. Who was the person that sort of stepped in and, and was the fire extinguisher and, and, and took yeah, care of that? I mean, there there were times there were times when I was that person. But I would say those 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 people that I named were kind of very good about like really good about like sort of even just mediating themselves you know like like if you if if if, 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 if you know like if someone's like well i need to remove myself from from this for a moment you know um uh everybody in general was pretty good at that but i would say that like our fire the the people that put out fires were like you know like jonathan keisha Durant. like they 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 helped to to really kind of put out fires when they when they came to be but i don't even know I don't even know if everybody would would say that for themselves, you know, I, because you know, there's it's also I'm super easygoing, <laughs> so right. so like as someone that's easygoing, sometimes I also like miss when things are, you know, like it's like oh, who's fighting, you know, um, <laughs> and um, you need people I, like you because not right, everybody yeah. <laughs> can be that like on everything because all of a sudden you guys will be down each other's throat and it'll be just a miserable experience and that's just the way you handled it. Um, right. And in terms of like what you do as a solo artist, how does that change in terms of like your creativity? Like the fact that, you know, I talked about the vaccine, you know, when you were, you guys were doing a, a sketch comedy show and you get, you guys were the, the ultimate filter. Now, now when you're the per- the one, how is that different from work, working with a group? I heard someone um, say it was, it was, um, I want to say it was Ashley Ward, a co- com- comedian improviser. Um, uh, who said, um, you know, people spend a lot of time paying attention to when there are no laughs, 
but I would say there might there's typically like one or two like chuckles in those instances and like try to follow those <laughs> you know um uh and that was something that i i heard that and that helped me to, to to really kind of understand like i get a lot of flack for the things that i find funny like in my working in groups you have people who are like that's who don't who don't vibe with you you know uh uh sometimes uh uh and um uh, but I, I, once I heard Ashley say that, it made me realize like, right, yeah, like I found this funny, which, which must mean that there's another person on the planet that <laughs> right. finds, me, finds that funny. And then potentially out of the 7 billion people there are, <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a corner of the world <laughs> that finds this, this, you know, and, so, and, and, uh, and so that's something that I live by. Like I try to, I try to hold on to like, does it make me laugh? Yeah. You know, and, and if it makes me laugh, then how can I continue to refine this, you know, so that I can reach more people. Um, uh, but like, I try not to, like, I don't think, and I say this in my like impressions and characters classes, it's like, I don't think anything should ever be thrown away. <laughs> you know, I don't think, it, I don't think you should ever, you know, you can always go back to something and, 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 and tweak. You can always polish a turd is what I'm saying. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, it's so funny because that has me thinking about George R. R. Martin has this classic line and, and I use it all the time is he says, art isn't a democracy. And yeah. I think sometimes people don't realize that comedy is, is a form of art and like you said if you find it funny hopefully someone else finds it funny it, but yeah not everybody has to find it funny yeah <laughs> exactly. how, how do you thread that needle yeah i mean i uh not well <laughs> i'll say <laughs> not not well but i do um you know uh, uh like i said i mean i am often the like on my i do a podcast with jonathan and and Gerard, and we have still been we've been doing that since maybe a year or two into astronomy club and it's still going on. Um, and, uh, and I, and I am often like the butt of jokes because of like, it's like, uh, because of things that I, the types of things that I think are funny or the types of things that I'm moved by or excited by it's a movie review podcast. So, you know, it's, it's all content driven. Um, and, uh, and so like I, but, but I have come to, to Im really just embrace it, you know, like, I, I guess I, I thread it by being like, I like, <laughs> if I like it, then it's good, <laughs> you know, <laughs> then it is good, <laughs> you know, and, uh, uh, and yeah. sort of like refusing to back down kind of. Thing. That's so cool. And so tell me about what you're doing now. You're obviously still very busy. You know, I follow you on TikTok. You're always, you're always spouting about something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But in terms of like create, creating <laughs> stuff, because I feel like that's one of the things that separates humans from animals. You know, mm -hmm. we we can create stuff. And now with technology, we don't have to uh, audition for a Lloyd Knight at a UCB. We yeah, don't have yeah. to be part of a, a, a network to create. We don't have to do that to even make a living nowadays. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so how so how are you t handling this transition in, in your point of your career? Because you like me were coming up through the time of you needed one person to think you were funny to put right. you in the show to cast mm -hmm. you in this thing but now the control's in your hand so how are you handling this control of your career yeah i mean i'm i'm a lot in, in many different ways but um i'll say first and foremost is that i am always trying to find a tribe you know always looking for you know and and um not to say that like I'm moving away from my astronomy club family or my black McCann jump family at all, though we still we're, we still work together in a variety of different ways. Um, but it's, you know, for, for as much as I'm forging my own path, I'm, I'm, you know, keeping in mind people that I've worked with and trying to keep, you know, there are things that I can do that I can do well. And there are things that I cannot do well, you know, and when, and when it comes to those things, it's, it's important to, you know, have, you know, your collaborators and have your, you know, you know, your people around you that can, that can do the fill, fill in those gaps that you can't do. I know nothing about sound production, <laughs> you know, right. I need be, I, uh, you know, and I, and I, a couple years ago started a, uh, a production company. It's called rule of three. 
and um, and I started with comic books actually, and so that's a that's a whole other network of of people that I've that I've started working with. But um, but it's a it's been a great way for me to to get these ideas out that I, you know, have been uh, working on for so long. I had a friend who recently said, screenwriters are the only people who, if you do not get a job or have the means to produce your own work, you don't actually have examples of your work to share, right? Like, yeah. I mean, like you, of course you have scripts on scripts on scripts, but it's like, unless people are going to sit down and read your 200 page movie, <laughs> you know, yeah. then, then like, then, then what do you really have to, to show? And I, and I started with comic books and I've, and I've, and I've moved on to, to producing uh, shorts as well. And, and, um, and I, and I truly love being where the buck stops in terms of like, it's like, I, I, I do like that joke. I'm going to keep it in. I do love that imagery. I'm going to keep that in, you know, and then, and then sharing it and seeing what the, the reactions to that is, 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 is tremendously rewarding. That's so cool. Didn't you guys do a short that was in slam dance a couple of years ago? We did. Film? Yeah. Yeah. Black, yeah. Black, uh, 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 Gerard, uh, got us together to, to do that. It was based off of a, um, script that we wrote. We had a, we had a development deal around the same time as astronomy club, um, uh, to write a series for IFC that, right when we when it was finally time for it to be um considered was right when i don't know if ifc is fully gone but they like had it uh they had like a buying free they like they like couldn't yeah i think they're produce. like law and order reruns now yeah I think yeah that's always yeah. True. yeah and yeah. So, and so and so it was like they weren't doing anything uh, original anymore and so we had we have eight episodes um which consists of uh, shorts <laughs> in each, you know, there's, there's like two 11 minutes in, in each episode. Um, and so we had a, a bunch of those and Gerard was like, let's just do one, you know, let's just pr produce one. And so he, you know, did, did the work of like sort of using his producer mind, you know, this one is the one that is most producible. And, uh, and, you know, and we, we raised funds on Indiegogo and, um, and and shot it and it and it got into, into slam dance and that was another that was another example of one of those things where it was like wow we wrote this years ago you know and like and we and we had went through so many hoops and try and tried to get it made you know in the end you know we we after ifc couldn't do it we shopped it around to a couple of the play, you know and like really tried to to get it going and it was just so great to 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 see that fully realized and it did really well like i I I talk about it as if it's not my my short because I didn't direct it, uh, you know. And I so I keep I I think about it as like Jira's short, even so. So if I start talking about it as if like I'm fully <laughs> removed from it, that's why. That's just something yeah. going on in my in my head that I just can't I can't stop. <laughs> as a I wrote I co-wrote and co-starred in this, but I, I was like, say, yeah, like... <laughs> you're in it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but so it's a, I just needed to acknowledge that if I start talking about it, and yeah. it's, as if separate um but um it but it did it, it did it did really well and i would say surprisingly well but i but i don't think i'm not super so you know we we we, we won a, a handful of awards and got into a bunch of different a bunch of different festivals and and um and that was it was really awesome to see people you know this idea that i remember you know, pitching, pitching lines on and, and, and plot points on in like some random conference room and probably at, at MTV, Jarab was at MTV at the, at the time, you know, like probably some MTV conference room pitched some idea. <laughs> That's so cool. And, you know, I love what's inspiring about talking to you. And, and this is one thing that when people ask me about, you know, do I get started in a podcast or get started in a film? Um, I think the, the, the big step is actually doing the thing like the, the Nike slogan, yeah. just do it. Um, yeah. because I was, I, a, a couple of years ago, I had an idea for a short film. I had a friend who was a filmmaking filmmaker. We just self financed it. We did the same thing you did. We put it and it's, and I'm super proud of it. And the one thing I tell people yeah. is like, I'm not winning any Oscars for it, but you know what? At the end of the day, I made a thing and it's yeah. there. Like I yeah. made a thing. So t for folks who are having trouble making the jump of having the idea, because an idea, as you know, 
Don't mean shit unless you do something with it. Yeah. Make an idea, like a creative idea, and make it into a reality. Maybe advice for someone, and maybe an advice that you've learned for yourself when it comes to like having having a nugget of something and making it into something that's real and tangible. Well, tell me about those struggles and, and how you how you think people can learn from you from what you've been through. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, a, a couple of things I'll say is, <clears throat> you know. I'm someone who picks things apart. <laughs> so I'm very George Lucas in that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, you know, something will be done and I'll be like, but is it, you know? Um, uh, but I, but to the point of what you just said is like, is n you cannot take away an idea that you've put out. Like once it's out, it's out, you know? Yeah. And that is worth so much. You know, I, would, I just had this thought of like, um, you know, you, you, that, that, that saying you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take the, the, the other half of that is like, and, and the more shots you take, the better at shooting you'll be. <laughs> and that was something that like, never, it, that side of it never really sank in for me until recently, you know, that like, it's like you, you go for it, really try and, and like, and have the pitfalls and like, and have the like, shoot, we don't have enough money for this figure, figure out what the, what the uh, budget save is, you know, and, um, and, you know, and like, and, but until you do it, there's nothing there, <laughs> you know, there, you don't, you, <laughs> you know, we can all, we can all say where, this is something that I honestly love about it because uh, what I'm about to say is because, you know, being in the industry and like trying to get jobs and trying to do this, that, and, and the other, you can feel like you're not doing it. <laughs> you know, you can feel like, you know, because you don't have the job or because you're not making money or you're not whatever. But the thing that I love about self-producing and, you know, and trying to raise funds and, and do it and doing whatever is that like you, you, you can do it <laughs> when you do it yourself, you know, when you, when you put it out yourself, you, and, and you don't have, you also don't have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on these things. Right. Like, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I understand there's an element of privilege to even say this, but it's like iPhone cameras are so <laughs> yeah. advanced, you know, you know, um, you know, and so if you have access to even a, 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 a cell phone with a, with a good camera, or, you know, someone who does, you know, it's like, just make whatever you can, you you know, you'll be better off for it. And uh, I was curious about your tinkering phase w with, how did you deal with that in the world of improv? Because as you know, on and gone, you can't, did, were you one of those people after you got off the stage, like, I should have said this one line. Did, or did you yeah. open yourself up? I I did and and still do, and it's why yeah. I don't do improv as much anymore. I don't know how closely you follow my social accounts, Joe, but I <laughs> very publicly quit improv uh, uh, for a year, but kept doing <laughs> shows during that time because. Right. I couldn't let it go. It felt like it felt like it was like I need to be doing this, but also I can't keep doing this because it is literally killing me to <laughs> to be like so kicking you're the, myself. You're, you're living like, the tortured artist life, James. It sounds like you're the tortured artist. Absolutely, you are so cliche. <laughs> absolutely, no, but truly, and I and it's like I mean, it's so dumb. But I'll be like, why didn't I say this? And I'll think about it for four days after the show, and it's like, what is? And I still do. I've been doing improv now in my life for multiple decades okay <laughs> and 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 yeah it just it's ridiculous <laughs> but yeah. i still but no. it's there it's still there yeah that's why i cannot do improv I, I, was, I sucked at it too but also i was my own toughest critic i'm like I, this sketch comedy is fun i could spend like two weeks working on a sketch and then i'm, I'm I, I can make it as perfect as i possibly can and then I'm, yeah. I'm sure with you james you probably went back like all right it's done but i wish i could have done this one extra thing or something absolutely. like that absolutely yep Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So what are you passionate about right now? Let's let's wrap this up by talking about the future of James the Third, the next decade, the next chapter of the story. Uh, what, what are yeah. you super passionate about outside of the production company? But what else? What else you got going on? I mean, it, it is uh, it is a lot of that, um, uh, honestly. But also, I mean, I'll just say if we're if we're talking outside of the, the prod company, I'll just say, you know, I have a, a, a 20 month old daughter wow. <laughs> and uh, and raising her is fantastic. And she is she is the 
the the biggest ball of joy and love and also the most annoying person <laughs> on planet earth <laughs> and so uh this is a, a a journey that i'm i'm really excited to be on and like and yeah i mean i i you know i'm excited to i'm excited to continue to create and 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 get work out there and um and like i said i started making shorts i'm i'm i've been i've been doing some directing it, it was it's hard <laughs> it's all it's hard and new to me and so and so getting better at either getting better at that or understanding you know my role as a writer producer and how you know how i can be creative and continue to execute uh, uh my vision in in those ways as well so i'm i'm you know i'm i'm super excited about that journey that's so cool and also by the way having the kid it's great content, as you're probably going to come yeah. to find out. I remember my old boss in my radio days, he was like an older guy, but his he had a teenage daughter. So like every day he'd be like, hey, did you hear this new song from Jay-Z? I'm like, why don't you hear that song from Jay-Z? <laughs> yeah. Oh, because, <laughs> right. because his daughter was listening to it in the car. So just imagine the possibilities, James, of this yeah. daughter of yours. Man, all this content that's coming your way. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited to, to, to be young again through her. Absolutely. <laughs> Or or be further reminded at how old I am through her. Either one. <laughs> Circle of life, James. And so for folks who want to keep track of what's going on in your life, what's the best way to do so? Yeah, so you can follow me uh, uh, on Instagram at Rule of Three Inc. I have a Kickstarter for my comic book company going on right now through June 9th. Um, uh, so please check that out. You can also go to Rule of Three Inc. dot com. And in each case, is three is the number three, and Inc. is I N C. <laughs> awesome. James, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. And that's today's Good Listen. I'm Joe Pardavila. You can always connect with me on X, LinkedIn, and Instagram, Joe Pardavila, or TikTok at Jay Pardavila. If you like, you can send me a note at joepardavila at protonmail.com and tell me your story. And lastly, if you can leave a five star review on Apple or Spotify, that would be awesome. And if you're watching on YouTube, why don't you give us a big old thumbs up? Thanks for spending some time with me. I'll see you next time. Adios.